Recently, um, the Canadian Social Justice Tribunals had decided to fine Canada $40,000 for every Indigenous child who was taken out of his house uh, by social services um, in the year 2003 or something, um, in, the, in the last couple of years. And, okay, listen, I, as I said, if I'm okay, if, if I didn't punch a hole in the wall when Omar Carter got $10.5 million of taxpayer money, I'm going to survive Indigenous kids who are taken away from their families getting $40,000. Okay, that's not... That's not what I'm mad about here. What I'm mad about here is the system that does it to them and the fact that the system that oppresses and humiliates and keeps the native Canadians poor and destitute forever is not allowed to be challenged because of political correctness. This taking the kids away from their families, this wasn't done in the 1960s, 1950s, back when we didn't know that racism was bad. This was done uh, following the 90s and early 2000s of liberal governments. And the reason it happened is because there were laws stating that you are, Indigenous people are entitled to the exact same services on reserve as we get off reserve. But that's impossible to get because the reserves are places of corruption and socialism. The reserves are these sort of socialist havens, and please don't tell me that socialism and reserve culture was part of uh, the Aboriginal experience in 1607 before Samuel de Champlain landed on Quebec City. No. The reserve systems are designed to fail. And what they do is they fail because they are designed to do so. So if you're entitled to the exact same amount of services on reserve as you are off reserve, it's kind of hard because, right, the reserves are owned collectively by the, uh, by the tribe. It means no one owns land individually, so collective land ownership, which means if you want to develop your land, you want to innovate, you want to do something new, you, want, you can't really do that. Right? You don't have control over that. You have to go through a committee, you go through a committee to go through the government. So the committee controls you, right? And then all the money goes down into that committee. So they don't really have an incentive to change anything because all the money is running through them. Then if you want other services, right, you need healthy, right? A lot of these places are northern, right? You need um, different services, right? Services in urban areas aren't equal to those in rural areas, indigenous issues aside. Right? You have, then you add in the fact that, okay, we're usually going to a northern rural area, then we're adding an indigenous element. Now some rural communities can get you know, buoyed by sort of emigration to them, or immigration to them, sorry. You could get, you know, doctors or nurses or outsourced schools that come to them. But you don't really get, you know, we'll say white people, black people, you know, non-native Canadians, they don't move on to the reserves because it's collectively owned, because it's for those people to help them with the services, which means you'll never be able to get equal services. So what did the government do? Because they weren't getting equal services there, they ended up taking the kids out of the families to the place where they can get better services. Now this is bad because you shouldn't separate kids from their families unless there's, you know, physical or sexual abuse going on. So this was caused by do-gooder idiocy. Not evil, conservative, whatever, whatever. And no one's willing to talk about this. No one's willing to talk about it. It was actually a confusing amount of laws and do-gooder law after do-gooder law after do-gooder law stacked on top of a failing socialist system that caused these problems. So the way we need to help the indigenous because they they do deserve equal treatment, is we need to be talking about this. We need to be talking about a restructuring the reserve system. We need to talk about maybe dissolving the councils and the community ownership and giving people private ownership over their lands and, and rights to, to do with their land what they want to do with it, just like all other Canadian citizens. But our big focus is sort of on truth and reconciliation. And here is what I want to hit on, because Truth and reconciliation, I actually think, can save Canadian society and help push us forward. And, and there's a lot of what the West is, is our biggest enemy right now is historical inaccuracy. And the, the way the left works is, you see this when they take down Sir John A. Macdonald statues. You decontextualize history, you misinterpret history, then you erase the history, right? Decontextualize the concept of John A. Macdonald, right? Oh, so he was, you know, oh, he said bad things about the natives, right? Then we misinterpret it, right? We don't say that, you know, his government actually, although not perfect, and although 150 years ago, they actually fought against even more draconian laws against them. So John McDonald, by the times, was actually was not that oppressive. Then we erase it by taking away his statue. This helps no one. And while we're trying to build these uh, the image of the natives, and, and I took a, I mean, in university was, was real eye-opening to, to how we view Native American society. We are doing the same thing to the natives. We're, we're erasing their history and replacing it with fantasy land. Now, I've known this because I've seen how the universities deal with Israel-Palestine, right? It's, it, they don't teach history, they just teach fantasy land. They don't teach Canadian history, it's fantasy land. They don't teach 
you know, native Canadian history. It's all fantasy land. And I've talked out from people from India and Japan, and it's the same, the universities do the same thing to their culture. We all, we all actually have suffered from the same problems from the radical left. I'll give you an example of what I was told. Basically, I took a course called Human Geography, so you learn nothing about human beings or the concept of geography. In every single class, we talk about something that is bad, and then the teacher will go, and this is just like how Canada mistreated the Aboriginal people. Da -da -da. Every single class. It got to one point where we are literally talking about a road in Turkmenistan. The teacher actually can't say Turkmenistan. She was such a douchebag. She took a mister. It didn't even end in Stan. That's how big of a douche she was. She said, well, the government's building a road in Turkmenistan. And this is kind of like what the Canadians did to our Aboriginal people. I'm like, nope, I'm out. That's a road in Turkmenistan. It has literally nothing to do with the Iroquois nation. Literally nothing. I will, I will say, yes, there were historical injustices done to the Native Americans. It has nothing to do with roads in Turkmenistan. Zero. I'm out. Screw this. And then we finally got to the week where we learned about indigenous people. And oh boy, what did we just learn that they are cartoon characters. Not really people, anyway. We learned that um, the reason why it was, we did the evil white people trick them with their contracts. You know, the Iroquois, ha the, the Inuit had 200 different words for snow, but it's not really, that's racist, it's compound words. It's like, yeah, compound phraseology, we, we get it. But the Inuit had 200 words for snow, but not one for legal contract, therefore, oppression. And you're like, what the hell are you talking about? And it's really indigenous were smarter than us because they knew how to navigate the forest. It's like, okay, get cultures of different things. Like, the Europeans probably knew more about seafaring because they came over on boats. And of course, the Iroquois knew about going in the forest. Like, this is, this is nonsense. What are we learning right now? But then they made it seem, they actually said innovation was bad. And they made innovation seem like it was a white invention. White people are evil. Remember, white people are evil. They were very clear. White people are evil. But white people are also superior. The whole thing was basically distill. You could distill it down to white power. And the way that that human geographies is taught and all other, you know, social justice courses are taught. History can basically summed up from their perspective of, listen, you had non-white people and they were just hanging out playing the bongo, smoking weed. Everything was great and they were geniuses. Then the white people came and they started to value innovation and science and engineering and it destroyed these cultures because the white people are evil. It's like, this is literally what the Ku Klux Klan says and I'm learning it here in human geography. I, at one point I wanted to scream, they're fucking people, not these magical forest creatures that you're making them out to be. So the left is not interested in the real history of these people and the real history is their people. So we have a big opportunity to actually learn about the indigenous people here in Canada and their true story if can be told properly, as it should be, can actually help us save our own culture, which is important. The left, and the right ignores this because we're too afraid to fight anything about it. The left wants to tell the story of the indigenous people that it's this horror show. They want to turn Canada's treatment of the indigenous people into the Holocaust. And what it really is, is a, is a Shakespearean tragedy. So let me break down what I actually mean here. I'm not saying the Holocaust isn't tragic. I'm not saying that parts of the uh, native uh, America, uh, European relations are, are not horrific. I'm saying a, a, a Shakespearean tragedy in the sense that it's not a story of uh, kill the babies, Bleh. right? It's a story of betrayal, you know, once friends, once brothers falling apart, right? It, it, it's, it's an emotionally, you know, hitting story because there's a chance for togetherness and reconciliation and working together and, and Tecumseh being part of the formation of the nation of Canada and then it all falls apart tragically due to indifference and human things and different influences. So, again, I'm not saying the Holocaust isn't tragic, but the Holocaust is, is a horror show. There's no, oh, if Hitler had just, you know, done this, or the Jews had done this. No, it was literally, let's build the camps and murder all these people. It's utterly horrific, right? There's no, oh, the Jews and Germans just couldn't get along. It was horrific from scene, from scene one to scene, scene end. But that's not the story of the natives. When they get here, there actually is a lot of cooperation, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, this, oh, the British tricked them by playing these people off each other. Guys, come on. The British didn't invent this. Everyone, like, Alexander the Great did this, Genghis Khan did this, the Mongols weren't the most, you know, intellectually advanced society, but they figured this out, right? The Mi'kmaq, as you said, the Mi'kmaq made a living off of playing the English off the French and the French off the English. The Mi'kmaq weren't stupid. There's politics. They realize there's people that go blah, 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 and there's people that go blah, 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 and the blah, 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 don't like the blah, blah, blahs. So whichever side was losing, they would prop up that side because they wanted to keep both of them there so they could keep getting the best deals. 
Doesn't sound like people who are confused by legal contracts to me. They didn't have land. Look at a fort built, look at an, an Iroquois fort, okay, and tell me they didn't understand land ownership. So get that garbage out of here. Oh, there were these peaceful people and the Europeans were at war. The border between Ontario and Quebec is literally the, the current battle line between the Algonquin and the Iroquois when the Europeans landed. Okay, so throw all that out. Now, even within different subcultures and different nations, and I'm not an expert on everything, right, you had, you had Cree who would support the uh, British, Cree who would support the French, Cree who, who didn't support either, Cree who traded, Cree who committed massacres, Cree who got massacred. It was a whole conflict of people. It was human beings trying to interact with human beings. There was raiding, there was trading. So when the French were finally defeated, the Plains of Abraham, and they left, there was a new balance restructuring in, in North America. And good for the natives, or good for the natives at the time, is the Americans that started a revolution. Right? So it actually reestablished the power balance. It wasn't now between British and French, but again between Americans and British. And when the Americans invaded Canada in the War of 1812, who saved Canada? Right? The only reason that Canada was saved was because of the Pan-Indian Alliance, or the Pan-Indianism created by Tecumseh. And one of the things you have to understand about the natives is they, are never, they were never a homogenous people except for about two years under Tecumseh. And when he died, it all fell apart. So Laura Secord, right, our, you know, Paul Revere, when she found out the Americans were going to invade a village, who did she go to? Right, I believe it was Cree warriors? I could have been wrong about that. But it was indigenous. She uh, notified indigenous people, and they stopped the American raid on a village. They saved people. Right, without Tecumseh, Canada doesn't exist. Without the native coalition taking our side, Canada doesn't exist. That's something we have to acknowledge. And you, the natives wouldn't have backed us if it was all rape and murder and pillage forever. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm not saying Cornwallis didn't put out scalping things. I'm not saying none of that happened. But I'm not saying that wasn't the, I'm saying that wasn't the only thing that's happened. And until you acknowledge the truth, which is we were once brothers, once allies, that, that fell into a pattern of betrayal, mostly out of apathy, mostly out of convenience, most of out of, out of, out of forget, right? When the Americans, when, when the when the Americans wanted to expand, we needed to expand westward. So the people who were saved in 1812 were replaced with Europeans coming in to settle those lands in the 1840s. And they didn't have the same affinity. They didn't remember what Tecumseh did for them. Right? And then problems started to get bad. Then Sitting Bull happened. Okay? Then there was problems. And then because of the problems, other people attacked other people. Things got messy. Right? People got isolationist. We ended up turning our back on them. But this story that the left wants to tell, that they were just these magical Puritan forest creatures, not really, you know, involved in politics and military, is not true. And the best way, if we want to get our history back, if we want to go into the universities and say, you have to stop teaching our kids nonsense, teach them about the real Canada, the only people that will, they'll listen to right now are the indigenous. And the indigenous, the real story, is actually a much better story for everyone than the fake story being told today. You know, back in the racist times, they were just wild savages who will kidnap your kids and, and scalp them and, and do all horrible things. That's racist and evil. But now we have the noble savage. Now we have the cartoon characters. Now we have the pot-smoking, bongo-playing hippies who are just sitting in a forest having a good time, who were destroyed by the white man. Neither is true. Neither is true. They were human beings with human failures prone to human political decisions. And until we can tell the real story of them, there'll never be truth and therefore there'll never be reconciliation. And if we can find truth, right, if we are able to say this is what happened for the natives, then we get a part of our history back because it's a shared history. And this is what we need because if we don't learn from our history, we're doomed to repeat it. And the left's number one crusade is to erase it. And I think the pathway to saving Canada is actually through the indigenous and truth and reconciliation.